Um, Margarita has received her B.S. in Biology from Universita de los Andes in Colombia, her M.S. in Genetics and Evolution from Universidad Federal de Sao Carlos in Brazil, and her Ph.D. in Entomology from Cornell University here in the USA. She is broadly interested in understanding how environmental change and life history traits affect her demography, health, and long-term persistence of bee pollinator populations. Okay, so yes, this is her talk on feral bees. Sorry to Welcome. make you pronounce all of those <laughs> names. <laughs> Welcome, Welcome, Thank you. Um, well, hello everyone. Um, I guess I, I wanted to start by saying that I am not a beekeeper, right? So I'm a, an evolutionary biologist and I have been working with bees for 16 years. Um, and so really my, um, my long history in research has been mostly focused on uh, native solitary bees. That's where, you know, like the bulk of my life as a researcher has been focusing on. And um, about five years ago, I started doing research with honeybees. Um, so, um, so I am going, uh, uh, Patricia invited me to share um, some of the information that we have gathered about feral honeybees in Pennsylvania. So this is uh, research that we have been doing in the lab for the past three years. Um, okay, so I, um, I don't like talking by myself or about myself for a long time, so I'm just gonna basically like keep asking questions to you to, so that I don't, you know, like I don't hear my voice all the time. So I want to start with this question. Where are honeybees from? And I'm not going to answer. Earth. This is a question for you. Asia. Geographically, where on Earth? Asia. Asia, okay. So I guess, um, so how many honeybee species are there? Let's start there. More than three. More than three, yes. <laughs> Sorry, what? Less than six. Less than six, <laughs> almost. Okay, so um, there are seven. Um, honeybee species, okay? And I mean, the taxonomy of honeybees is actually quite controversial. Um, so, you know, like there are a lot of like subspecies and then, you know, taxonomies sometimes have, you know, like um, different opinions about what makes a species a species. Um, these are photos of, you know, like the seven species that, you know, according to this paper um, are, you know, true species of honeybees. And these colorful bubbles here on the map are showing you the distribution of these seven species, okay? So here in red, we have Apis mellifera, the bee that we have here uh, in the US that is you know, like managed worldwide. And then you see that really the center of diversity of honeybees is in, in Southeast Asia, okay? So as we have been hearing uh, through today's talk, a lot of the pests that we have in our managed honeybees actually come from species, um, from, from uh, are pests that have jumped from other honeybee species to the, the to Apis mellifera, and then they have a spread throughout the world. Um, okay. After that, so so currently Apis mellifera is you know like everywhere, right, um, on the, uh, on the planet, but here on this map. We actually see a little bit of, you know, like the specific region of the world where they are from, right? Like where they were, uh, where they evolved, and uh, before humans started managing and uh, spreading them throughout the world. Okay, so um, that are um, Apis mellifera has um, the native distribution is located in Africa, Middle East, and Europe. And on this map here, I am actually showing you where uh, some of the subspecies of honeybees uh, are located, okay? So um, I really wanted to like share with you kind of like these maps and these distributions because um, I feel like these figure um, shows you a lot of the diversity, the kind of like the native diversity of honeybees. And it shows you, uh, if we think about, you know, like where these bees evolved, right? It shows you that makes you think about the diversity of uh, conditions 
uh, where they, you know, like evolve, right? So if we think about climate, for example, we have, you know, like wet tropical forests here, we have temperate areas here, right? Like, so if we think about all of the different conditions of these native range of honeybees, is quite diverse. Okay, we know honeybees were introduced into the new world, um, in the 17th uh, century, and then you know, as soon as these uh, bees were brought into the new world, we know bees, they started swarming, they started moving into tree trunks, and um, of course, you know, like what we call today feral bees, you know, like it started kind of establishing, okay? So, um, so the reason why, so here in the native range, um, uh, colonies that live in, you know, like in, like that in tree trunks are called wild, but because the the honeybee is not native from the U.S., these colonies that live, you know, in wild conditions are called feral because at some point in the past they were managed. Okay, so um, so that's why we call them feral. And after the arrival of uh, varroa. Um, you know, like the, the, the general impression was that a lot of these colonies that were living in these, you know, wild conditions basically got disappeared, right? Like the, the pressure of the pest basically killed uh, all the colonies and um, they were gone. So, um, so a lot of the research um, here in the U.S., of course, a lot of it are, you know, like it's like 99.9% .9 of the research happens in colonies that are managed, right? Um, and this is thinking about, you know, like applications for beekeeping um, and basically apicultural research. But, um, but I am really interested in what is happening with these colonies that live in feral conditions. And, um, and this is what I'm going to basically talk uh, to you about today. So why am I interested in, um, in studying feral honeybees? I just, I just want, us to like maybe brainstorm about some of the differences between managed and feral honeybees. How are they different? Feral bees are definitely treatment free. They are treatment treatment free, yes. What else? They can build the structure of comb whatever size and dimension and shape that they want. Sure. <coughs> yeah. So that's, yeah, that's thinking about, you know, like the management aspect, but, but what, uh, what other aspects of, you know, like these feral um, colonies are different from managed colonies? So yeah, the nest structure is definitely different. What else? Hive density. Hive sure. density, definitely, yeah. What else, Devin? Sorry, did you raise your hand? Uh, I would be guessing that they're, they're less, they're, they're more pure species because they're not cro being crossbred by beekeepers so much. Okay, so the genetics are, um, yeah, I guess maybe this is part of, I, I don't have that on the list, but yeah, that's, a, that's actually a good point, like how the genetics um, vary. Okay, so th those are some, and I don't remember exactly everything that I have here. Um, but this is um, this table is actually from an article article by Tom Seeley um, that was published in American Bee Journal a couple of years ago. He's all about Darwinian beekeeping, um, and you know, like he came up with you know, like the, the the table is actually way longer than this. But I just um, picked a few of the traits that I think are are really interesting. So um, one of the things, and maybe this is related to the genetics point, right? Um, one of the things is that uh, if we think about, you know, like the dynamics of these wild populations, um, honeybees are adapted to the local um, environment. And so uh, if we think about what we just talked about, uh, the, 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 the whole species, right, is distributed in all of these regions, but it has actually differentiated into different um, subspecies that are locally adapted to the environment, right? And I feel like this is a lot of what we have been hearing about. And um, this is one of the reasons why um, we think that, you know, Georgia packages are really bad or, you know, like do really poorly in the Northeast, right? Like there is nothing that we're doing to help the bees adapt locally to the environmental conditions of the U.S. that are quite different from, you know, like north to south, uh, south, east to west. Um, 
The other, the other difference is that yes, the, the density is quite different, right? And so, um, so this is a map from a, stud a recent study of feral colonies in forests in Germany. And um, so these are some numbers for you to have an idea. So there is one colony per 20 square miles in the forest. Right, uh, and in upstate New York, in the Arnold Forest, where Tom Seeley has his my tolerant population, we have about one colony per three square miles. Right, so it, the the um, the density of these colonies is quite different in wild conditions. Um, other things that are different is exactly the, the nest structure. Structure. So someone was talking about that. Um, they usually live in smaller cavities. Um, the, the colonies in tree trunks usually, I mean, always have this propolis coating that is not always uh, a present in, in managed colonies. And the, um, the cavity is, you know, like the structure of the cavity is, you know, quite different. So this is again from a, an old paper from Tom Seeley, you know, like, and this is just a diagram of, you know, like the, the cavity in the tree and, you know, like basically what I wanted to show you, where is the propolis coating? Where is that? Oh, the propolis envelope. So that's, you know, like basically what they are uh, outlining here uh, around the cavity, right? And this is something that not always is present in male cavities. <coughs> okay, um, and I guess the last, um, they frequently swarm, and I'm going to co uh, come back to this point. Um, but I guess the other thing that is different is that, as Robin was saying, these colonies are not managed, right? And so the colonies basically have to naturally deal with pressure from disease, right? Which is kind of like um, the, the foundation, a lot of the things that, you know, like we have heard this morning about, you know, like why, why we should keep um, treatment free bees. I have one question. Yes. So any uh, unmanaged colony, so he showed a picture of the bees inside a house, of the, so that would be feral, even though it's not in a tree, if it's uh, settled in somebody's attic or, and some of those get enormous, they're yes. really huge. Yeah. So it's not always a smaller, no, and that's the yeah. The, so this is this is you know thinking about maybe you know like bees in wild conditions. Um, now the um, the definition of feral is going to, you know, like I mean it's it can be multiple things, right? And so I can I uh, I, I think that depending on who you talk to, you know, like maybe a feral honeybee stock is going to be you know, like coming from a population that has lived in wild conditions for multiple generations, right? Um, what we are studying is not that. What we are studying actually are just like colonies that most likely have a very, very recent um, past in a managed condition, but that have moved to a cavity, even if, even if it is not a tree, uh, and that has successfully survived at least one winter. So that's for the purposes of our study, um, but uh, I guess kind of like more traditionally, you know, like there should be some sort of like genetic or isolation uh, in, you know, like uh, in an unmanaged uh, condition. And just one more, how do you yeah, find yeah. them? Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about that. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. So I wanted to transition to, you know, like why feral bees are, are interesting from, you know, like bees dealing with disease without management aspect. Uh, because of, as we know, varroa is, you know, a big problem. This is what, you know, like a lot of beekeepers are completely focused on. I, I agree when I go to beekeeping meetings, all I hear about is varroa control, varroa control, varroa control. <laughs> yes, yeah. I know, and, and I could relate to, you know, like, um, because yes, they are a problem, um, but that's not it, right? Like, um, honeybees, I mean, it's not, first of all, it's not the only problem, um, right? And there, we shouldn't, we should not only be talking about how to control this one pest. Um, and the, the other reason why this is, you know, f uh, for me is really interesting um, to, you know, like think about feral uh, um, bees and the absence of management is because we know that throughout the world, right, there has, the, there are reports of many populations where uh, tolerance to mites has evolved independently, 
right? And maybe, you know, like maybe your apiaries here are, you know, other, you know, like populations that we should be adding to these, um, these maps. Um, but, you know, like what is really interesting is that, again, in, and I'm going to talk about um, the mechanisms behind, you know, like these, um, these tolerance. What we see is that all around the world, we are seeing col uh, populations that are developing tolerance. So one key word to kind of like understand here is that the populations are developing tolerance, not resistance. Okay, so how are those words different? Anyone? Yes. Oh, okay. I was going to say that they, they tolerate, they're living with. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So this is why the two mite per 100 colony threshold, right, is highly problematic. Um, because if, you know, like the bees are tolerant, they may be living with the mites and they may be doing okay. Right? They are tolerating them. Uh, I honestly, I am very skeptical of any resistance, you know, like just naturally showing up. And I don't know if anyone, you know, here has any, um, you know, evidence for that. But I think what um, a more, more uh, mechanism that is more likely to, you know, like be effective is one that is based on, you know, like tolerance. And this is what um, this map is showing. So um, I'm just going to uh, comment on a few of these populations that have been, you know, like studied for a long time to go into why, why they have become uh, tolerant. So I'm going to talk about um, the Russian bees. So this is where the Russian bees that we were um, talking about this morning come from. So that um, is an area. So if we go back to our first map, right? So this is an area where uh, Apis mellifera is not native from. So right, it, it's, it was moved there as part of, you know, like the management uh, by humans. But it is a population that was in contact with Apis serrana uh, hundreds of years ago. So the transfer of the mite to, uh, from serrana to the Apis mellifera happened, um, you know, hundreds of years ago. And so this natural exposure to the mite um, helped them, you know, like develop tolerance. And that, those are the bees that were brought into the U.S. And those are the bees that uh, the Baton Rouge lab right now, you know, has a breeding program for. And, you know, it's what we call Russian bees. Um, so what, what they have found is that in general, these colonies um, have higher hygienic behavior and grooming behavior. And um, the brood of these, of these um, bees actually is, the mites are less attractive, attracted to the brood. So there, is, there are some changes in the chemistry, the way the brood, you know, like smells, that makes the mites less attractive to them. And then the mites have lower fertility. So um, I guess I don't know how, you know, familiar you guys are with, you know, like when we see the dynamics of mites, so, you know, like we see low, uh, low levels of mites during the year, and then at the end, you know, like it picks up um, late summer. So what happens is that even though the mites are there, the, the, the rate at which the mite population picks up is much lower. And so again, even though the mites are there, they, they don't do as much damage as they do in, you know, like um, in, in honeybee colonies that don't have these behaviors. Okay, so what about the Ardnot forest bees? Who has heard of the Ardnot forest bees from Tom Seeley? Yes. <laughs> um, <coughs> so, um, this is, um, this is a patch of forest that is, you know, north of Ithaca, New York, where Cornell is. And Tom Seeley had been studying those, you know, like wild bees or feral bees before the arrival of Varroa. He had a, he had a map of where the colonies were. He had density, you know, he, he's a naturalist. So, you know, he knew everything about those colonies. Then Varroa arrived. And then about three, four, five years later, he decided to go back. And, you know, his prediction was like, well, you know, like these feral colonies are all gone because Varro is here. And what he, we, what he found is that all the colonies were there, the same density, right? So what was happening? Um, so 
he started, there have been, you know, a number of studies kind of like, you know, like investigating why those colonies are, you know, like capable of surviving, even when, you know, like the Varroa mite um, levels are um, comparable to colonies, to manage colonies in, you know, like the, um, in close proximity. And one of the things that, you know, he has found is that, or what he thinks is, you know, like driving these dynamics in the Arctic forest is nest size. So he recently did a study where um, experimentally he kept, um, and you know, like, and, and this is, I'm, I'm sure this is not going to be, you know, a surprise to any of you, but um, he is, you know, like, he's kind of a proof of concept of the importance of, you know, keeping that small size for varroa control. So he experimentally kept colonies of one uh, medium or four mediums, okay, for two years. And basically here we just see, you know, like the levels of mites for, this is year one and this is year two, right? And so basically what you see is that the levels of the mites are completely different in large colonies. You just accumulate way more uh, mites. Uh, I don't think he had any data on survival, but basically what it, this is saying is that colony size is very important for varroa control, and it, it kind of like speak, you know, like talks back about you know like the importance of swarming or you know like these um, these these um, dynamics that are happening in um, in feral colonies that you know like in regular beekeeping operations it is the opposite of what what everyone does, right? So basically, sometimes beekeepers are working for the mites um, because they are, you know, like they they are preventing swarming. They are keeping these really, really large colonies that are just great for pests. Okay, and the last um, the last population that I wanted to talk about uh, are these populations in in, in Europe. Um, there was a recent study actually showing that they are showing uh, similar mechanisms of my tolerance and it is again something related to social immunity. So, social immunity. Everyone familiar with social immunity? No. I don't no. know the word. Okay, Two no. Words, so immunity. Let's start with immunity. What comes to your mind when we talk about immunity? Immunizations and uh, diseases. Exactly. So um, immunity. So in, um, for example, if you know, like for humans, um, uh, we talk about immunity in individuals, right? So when we, when our bodies get challenged with diseases, with pathogens, uh, the body responds with, you know, like enzymes and antibodies, and you know, it tries to control the disease at the individual level. Because, social, because honeybees are social organisms, they don't only have individual immunity, like each bee has their own immune system that is trying to control diseases, they also have another level that is called social immunity. <laughs> and these social immunity are kind of a group of behaviors that the colony uses to help, the, you know, like, to help prevent the spread of diseases or control diseases that are already in the colony, okay? So hygienic behavior, is um, one of those, you know, like behaviors that are part of this, the social immunity of the colony. Um, so this is, you know, like this is a, a figure of the kind of like the the Marlis Spivak um, test of um, uh, hygienic behavior, right? So what happens is that um, then then uh, basically you you put a what do you put some liquid nitrogen cold, you know, like. Um, is it, what is it? Is it a can? I've never known this assay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, and then, of course, you kill all the brood. And then, if your bees are really, really, really hygienic, um, they are going to, you know, remove all the dead brood out of there. Okay. If the bees are not so hygienic, uh, you expect to see, you know, like a much spotty, you know, like pattern in that circle. So uh, that's a behavior that you know has been studied for many decades. But what they are finding in those populations in France and in Norway is that the, the nurse bees, the worker bees, are developing a different type of um, more specific behavior to Varroa. So basically what they do is that they can smell um, the mites inside the brood even when they are capped, okay? And um, so what they do is they open the cap, 
but they don't remove the brood that is infested. Okay, they leave it in there, they, you know, like cap it back. Uh, and so you see, you know, like what the, they are describing is that you actually see, you know, like that the, the, the brood has been opened and, you know, closed again. And that behavior, just that opening and closing of the, the brood, actually slows down the reproduction of the mite. Okay, so once again, the colony may have a lot of mites, but those mites in the cells are not reproducing at a fast rate. And what that, what, and, and the result is that uh, the, the mites are not, they, the population doesn't build up as quickly and then um, they don't do as much damage to the colony. Yes? I think my understanding is that it doesn't kill the foundress mite, the older mite, but it will kill the young mites that aren't fully developed yet? Uh, I, don't, I don't think it, I don't think it kills the mites. I think they don't, they don't reproduce. Mm -hmm. okay. That's my understanding. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, like basically the, the, the female cannot, you know, like make babies. You know, like they, there's something that is slow down. Um, and so, yeah, I guess, you know, after that, that uh, pupa develops, you know, like they can go and reproduce somewhere else, but you know, it's just a sl the slowing down of the rate of reproduction of the mites. Um, and so that way the bee, that, that, that brood would still hatch someday. Like, oh yeah, absolutely, right? yeah. absolutely, yeah. Okay. So again, all of this is, you know, like tolerance. It's not like you're gonna have colonies that are mite free. The mites are there. It's just that the colony is doing something that is uh, slowing down the reproduction of the mites. In some way. Pretty clever of them, right? Yeah, the bees are clever, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, <clears throat> so, you know, like we could go over all the populations, but basically take a message here is that um, if, you know, like what we have learned from all of these populations is that when there is no treatment and the colonies have pressure from mites, um, you know, like they develop mechanisms of tolerance, right? And so what you would see, like Tonsil described, right? Like, or, I mean, he, this is what he... Exactly, right? <laughs> um, um, is that, you know, like there is a crash, yeah, we heard this this morning, and then, you know, like the population recovers and there is an stabilization of the population. So, um, okay. So, um, the question that I have is, you know, like, are there my tolerant populations in the U.S., right? Like, so Tom Seeley is, um, um, is, has described some, and I know a lot of people here have, you know, like, um, yards where mites are, uh, colonies are my tolerant. Uh, but what I'm really interested in understanding is how are these, you know, like, colonies doing that, right? Um, so what I showed you before is that in different populations, different types of behaviors evolve. Um, so I'm really interested in understanding what is it that our bees here are doing. Because again, these traits, I was, I, I was talking over lunch, these traits just don't evolve, right? Like they don't show up. They are in the population. The problem is that they are not advantageous because of management, right? So when we are letting survive colonies that, um, that uh, I mean, where, you know, like, where these um, mite tolerance behaviors are not advantageous, they are not going to increase in the population, right? Um, so, well, that's kind of like the, the premise. And, um, and I got, interested in, in, in this aspect of you know, feral bees after I was involved in a study in North Carolina where we actually started uh, studying the individual immunity of feral and managed colonies um, in urban centers. And what we found is that, uh, well, we you know, like mapped uh, over 20 pairs of colonies and we brought them to the lab in, in the lab, we challenge those bees with bacteria. And you know, we just uh, let them uh, sit for 24 hours, and then we kill the bees, and we analyze a lot of the immune genes in the bee bodies. And so what we found is that w these are um, four different immune genes um, that we analyzed. And what we found is that for three of those four, um, in all, on average, the feral colonies was, were producing twice as much of these immune genes, right? So, um, 
So I am really interested in understanding the role of um, this individual immunity for, um, in, you know, like this whole uh, story of the, the, the tolerance to mites. So, questions? No? Okay. So one thing to um, maybe keep in mind is that, so do you, do you guys think that this individual immunity is, um, so if we think about my tolerance and individual immunity, um, what do you think the role of individual immunity in my tolerance behaviors or, you know, like mechanisms is? Yes, Levin. Would it be in the resistance to the viruses that are vectored by the mice? Yeah. So that's what we're, that's what we're fishing. That's exactly what we're looking for. Um, so we have uh, this ongoing project for the past three years, and uh, basically we are interested in understanding disease pressure. We cannot really count mites in feral colonies because we don't have you know like nice removable you know like. Um, um, you know, parts to, you know, like do washes or anything. So we do all of this in the lab. And then we are also characterizing the immune responses of uh, feral and managed colonies um, with the idea of actually identifying traits that uh, we know are advantageous from the individual immunity point of view and that can be then, you know, like selected for for breeding purposes. Uh, so how we do it, um, so I, I don't know your name, sir. Linda. Linda. Um, so basically, we are uh, uh, working with, you know, like beekeepers, citizens. You know, like we go to clubs. We add, you know, like we talk about this project, and uh, then whenever anyone sees, you know, a feral colony anywhere, uh, they go and fill out these uh, form online, and then we follow up and we go and visit and do the the sampling. Yes. Do you measure um, the propolis? Uh, at all because that is uh, comparable to their ability to protect their eyes, like their immune system. Yeah, that's kind of external immunity. And so, yeah, that's definitely a confounding factor that we have. We, we are doing some, we're following up with experiments in the bee yard where, you know, we have the same environment. So, yeah, I guess the question is how does the environment of these feral bees, you know, like how, what is the role of that? Uh, that's a confounding factor right now in the study that we have. Um, but yeah, well, and you know, like this is actually a study that these two people in, in my lab, Katie Evans and Chauncey Hinshaw, they are, you know, like the ones who have been uh, collecting all the bees and doing all the, the lab analysis. But um, just to give you an idea, this is just the first year of data. I haven't updated this map, but we have, you know, received uh, in uh, reports of feral colonies basically everywhere on the state, right? And we do see, you know, like some colonies um, die, but uh, we know of at least, you know, like three colonies that have overwintered, you know, like three years in a row. Yeah, like that. Yeah. Okay. So I am going to speed up because I promised that I was going to be. Um, only 45 minutes. So basically, you know, like we go out and we collect foragers, right? One of the things that we do is uh, when people report feral colonies, uh, many of them have some sort of relationship with that colony, so they don't want any disturbance uh, whatsoever. So we just go with, you know, like ladders or really, you know, like uh, long nets and we collect foragers. We bring them to the lab and then we do uh, in the lab quantifications of, you know, viruses and immune genes. And that's what we, um, what we look at. Um, one of the viruses that we are uh, investigating is the four-wing virus. You probably have heard about this virus that, you know, like is, um, it works synergistically with mites and it is thought to be uh, linked to colony losses. And um, we also, well, and you know, I consider this, this virus to be an indicator of the level of mites in, in feral colonies because we know that um, the mites vector these, um, these viruses. And the other virus that we are adding is if you go to the B informed partnership uh, website, this is the second most prevalent virus uh, in the US, so we're also, uh, studying that and then I just have here a list of you know immune genes that really you know like 
I mean, these are kind of like general immune response. Those two are more uh, targeting viruses. And so we just look at how much of that uh, we have in the bees. Okay, so what have we learned? Um, the next few slides, you're gonna see a lot of these figures. Um, this is data that we have collected. Um, and so these are box plots. In, in blue, you're gonna see the, the results for the feral colonies, and in red here is gonna show the results of the managed colonies. And basically, if you see uh, points you know, like higher, that means that there is higher amounts of viruses or immune genes, and lower uh, means the opposite. So for viruses, um, we uh, have found that, this is the, the first year of data, we found that the levels of viruses are um, higher in the feral colonies, as expected, right? And we found very um, comparable results in the fall, so we didn't really see, you know, like a very dynamic um, pattern in terms of the, the viruses. And so we think that these, you know, like means that the feral colonies definitely have a very high pressure of mites. Uh, we are not seeing this difference in other viruses. For example, that second virus, black queen cell virus, is actually comparable levels between the feral and the managed colonies. Um, but what is really interesting is what we find in terms of survival. Right, so um, these are colonies that died after the first winter and survived after the first winter. Um, and these are the levels of the, the deforming virus, right? So what you see is that for the feral colonies, the colonies that had too much of that virus died. But then we had also colonies that had a lot of the virus and didn't die. Uh, the distributions of the virus look very different for the managed colonies, right? So probably because there is control um, for management uh, of mites, the, the, the colonies that died didn't, were not associated with uh, high levels of the virus. However, and this is just, you know, like the next slide is just gonna be for these colonies. Um, the first year of data actually shows that the, the feral colonies are actually dying at a comparable rate, right? So again, going back to these morning's talks, um, this kind of like reiterates this idea that um, even when you're treating for mites, you're not really having necessarily better uh, results in terms of losses, right? So that's precisely what we're finding with this. Um, the second year of data, so shows something is slightly different. So again, sorry, this is a lot of data. I'm just gonna walk you through it. So um, this is, these are the levels of virus for the feral in managed colonies for the second year. We actually don't see a huge difference um, in the, 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 the levels of the following virus for um, that virus or black cell virus, which is very you know, strange because again, how is it that I mean, where did the mites go last year? I don't know, but um, that's what, we, what we're finding. And of those colonies, we actually had higher losses in the managed group, okay? Um, so, well, so that's kind of like showing you, you know, like how sick, how, you know, like infested with pests and viruses are these feral colonies that have no management. And so we see that, you know, like the first year, that if they were more infested with uh, viruses the second year, it was actually quite comparable. But what we're finding is that um, some of the immune genes are actually always upregulated. There, there is more of these immune genes in the feral colonies. Uh, and the, that, that is, we're actually finding a correlation. This is just correlation between the higher expression of those genes and the survival of the colonies. So this is really exciting because we are um, actually being able to narrow down, you know, like what are some of the traits that may be helping, uh, that could help, you know, like uh, feral colonies and managed colonies survive if we select for the right traits. Um, we are also doing some um, social immunity tests. So we are, um, collecting, um, sorry, no, we got some swarm traps 
of feral colonies and we're bringing them to our bee yards and we're doing the, no, this is not what we're doing. We're doing the pain kill assay, which is slightly different, but the idea is to kill brood and then, you know, see how fast the, the worker bees remove that. And what we're finding, again, is that on average, the feral colonies tend to be more hygienic than the managed colonies uh, for these experiments. So I'm not going to bore you with you know, more figures or data, but um, I, I hope that you know, like I, I, I effectively share with you some of the, the things that we are finding with uh, feral colonies. And all of this has been done in Pennsylvania. Um, so we are not really finding a huge difference in the survival of uh, feral and managed colonies despite lack of um, treatment. And of course, I understand that for you guys, this may be like, duh, this is what we do. Uh, but for uh, other you know, like groups of people, this is actually quite shocking, right? Because everything is about the, the, the control of minds. So when I tell these, you know, people are like, what? How is that possible? Um, um, and we are, you know, like finding evidence of, you know, why this is the case. We're finding that these feral colonies have some traits um, involving in, in individual immunity and social immunity that are probably helping them um, deal with um, disease and pest pressure. And yeah, and so right now we're actually moving into, we're, we're sequencing the genomes of these colonies um, to actually see if we can find the genetic basis of these traits that we are uh, finding correlation uh, with. And yeah, kind of like in four breeding programs. So the idea would be to be able to develop an assay that you know we can go to your bee yards and we can check the bees and tell you, well, you know, actually these colonies have these traits that you know could be good for uh, a breeding program. So that's that's basically the goal of this whole thing. Um, yeah, and I don't know, this is our website. We have a lot of information. All of this information is found in our website, actually. We, we have, um, every semester we update the website with information. And yeah, we also have Twitter and Facebook if you want to, you know, like hear about what we do. And I'm happy to answer any other questions. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, and I was on time. Yeah. Three. <laughs> okay. I've got one little overall question. Do sure. You, like, do you two know each other? You're of so course. Same. I mentioned her during my talk this morning. Oh, did you? I did. <laughs> but, but I was just wondering, like, I think it seems like both of you, some of the answers you all come up with can help the other. Absolutely, 100%. So, yeah, I just yep. We started working together because Robin went, went to the my first uh, bee meeting, beekeeping meeting talk, Robin was there and yeah, we started talking and we found a lot of, you know, common interest and that's how we started, yeah, working together. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs>